This does not happen normally. As uh, I haven't said today, I usually consider myself the great interrupter. I, uh, you know, all of you end up having these great conversations and I end up having to stop them. So whenever Emily cues me up, are we ready to go? All right. Well, I'm going to offer, first of all, a formal welcome uh, to you, Dave, uh, and to your wife, Kathleen, Kathleen, who's here in the audience with us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, who are watching on live stream, I'm Tom Schreier, and I have really, truly the great uh, privilege of being the founding director of the Inspired Leadership Initiative here at the University of Notre Dame. It is our program uh, for those people who wish to, after they've uh, finished their uh, traditional career, come to Notre Dame uh, for an academic year to discover discern and design um, their life after um, uh, their traditional career. And certainly, if anybody's interested in learning more about uh, the Inspired Leadership Initiative, uh, you're welcome to visit our website at ili.nd.edu. So I want to also very much welcome uh, our fellows here um, and your guests and a few other guests that have joined us. And I want to also welcome those that are watching us via live stream uh, for participating in the first installment of this year's Inspiring Conversations, where we're going to be spending this academic year discussing the theme of kinship. And once again, we're just incredibly excited and also humbled by the number of people that have engaged in this program since we began in the fall of 2020. We've had over 1,300 people register for this series, representing over 34 countries. And that's faculty, students, friends, and others that have engaged in this. I also uh, owe gratitude to the Alumni Association, who's done just a wonderful job of creating this amazing platform and bringing this uh, program to life uh, from its very conception. Um, th I think ND has really become a powerful tool, I think, for Notre Dame uh, to bring itself out to the broader community, uh, whether it be alumni or friends or others across the globe. And um, with Dave, we've designed the conversation, uh, today's conversation, to have as much interaction and as engagement as possible. We'll kick off, uh, hopefully, uh, with a few questions and hopefully a lively conversation, and then we'll open it up here to the audience of the fellows uh, for live questions as well as questions uh, that can come in. For those of you that are on the live stream, you can submit your questions through the form, which is linked in the description of the live stream, and those questions will then be brought up uh, to Dave and myself. So. Well, Dave, thank you very much for being here. Should we get started? Yeah, great. All right, Thanks. yeah. Well, thank you for being here. Um, so you did your homework, I think, before you came here, right? Um, uh, I actually had the great, great pleasure of uh, giving my friend Dave some homework, and that was to read the book Tattoos on the Heart, uh, written by Father Greg Boyle. So I, th I just thought I'd start by asking if you have any initial reactions uh, from that book. Well, I, you mentioned the word kinship. I, I will be honest, it's not a word that I, that I use, yeah. uh, and I looked it up. Um, yeah. Just to say, okay, what definition are we dealing with here? But I, I think my takeaway from the book was how he immersed himself in the community, in the Los Angeles community, okay. specifically the Los Angeles gang community. And what I felt that he did was he gave people dignity and he gave them respect uh, through employment, through the company that he formed. But also, and I think that's the role of a leader, is to give people um, confidence, to, to you know, give them hope. And that's really what he did, and you know, he's certainly a person of faith, as we all know, uh, and clearly a very deep person. But his right. stories of what he called the homies or the right. homeboys and the gang leaders uh, were each one of them unique, but each of one of them had uh, was rooted in how can I help lift this person up so they can be better and so the community can be better. Right. Yeah, there, there's a concept related to kinship, which I think you're kind of tapping into, which is which is, I find with the book is interesting. And it's a concept of accompaniment, right? And instead of kind of lording over these people, yeah. uh, from my read of the book, part of the beauty is he engages with them, exactly. you know, and doesn't make anybody feel inferior in any way, right? And right. I think that's how, in many respects, he g gains their respect and has had the impact he has. Well, and he lived yeah. in the community. He right. lived amongst them, All right. and so it wasn't like he was coming in and you know right. going back to um, well, you know I don't even know the nice neighbor you know uh, Beverly Hills <laughs> right. or Brentwood or, you know right. Westwood, right. and then coming back in during the day. I mean, he was there. Actually, Kathleen and I have some good friends in Minneapolis, which is where we live, and they moved to the north side of Minneapolis, which right. is the equivalent, right. more or less, of where Father uh, Boyle was, was living. And they bought a house and they live in the community and they mentored and they had young kids living with them. But I think right. truly to have kinship, and so you have kinship, you know, blood relatives, but you also have kinship of making deep connections. You, 
you should be and you are at your best if you are immersed in the culture and the community and directly with that person. Right. Don't you think? Right. I think I think that's exactly right. I th and I think that's the beauty of it, right? And I remember from the book when he talks about Mike Douglas coming for 60 minutes. I don't yeah. know if you remember that, with a fleet of six white limos and he comes out in a flak jacket and Father Greg Boyle said, oh, are you going on an African safari or? <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but eventually, you know, he just has this artful way, I think, from being a part of that community of, you know, even drawing Mike Douglas in, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's, I think it's very powerful. And I think that does get to the essence of kinship. And, you know, I think that's why it's a fun topic to explore across a variety of different uh, uh, disciplines. But I think it's at the essence of where, and we can get, get off track, but where I think the country and maybe the world is, is, is a lack of a true appreciation sure for another person's perspective or another person's life. Right. And if you're just going to parachute in like Mike Wallace right. in a limo with a flag jacket, I mean, <laughs> you know, look at this message that you're sending. Right. I'm scared. Right. I've never been here before. I don't know what to expect as opposed right. to living there and, and appreciating someone's perspectives, even though you might think, okay, I don't agree with this or it's not the way that I would live. Right. But I, and I think that the barriers that are, that are and have been set up in this country and elsewhere, whether it's urban, suburban, political, religious, uh, racial, I mean, okay. that's, we, we, I think with kinship, you get that opportunity to truly walk in somebody else's shoes. Right. And how can you really under, appreciate or um, uh, gain their perspective unless you right. immerse yourself right. in their community and in them? Right, right. And, and I think, Dave, you know, you've hit on that's in, and first of all, there is no getting off track. I, I think, you know, part of the fun of this, I think, is to take it wherever um, the conversation goes. But, you know, I, that's the beauty, I think, of a concept like kinship and why we have that as the topic this year is um, to exactly to your point, it, it is so lacking in so many parts of, you know, the society writ large globally, right? Um, right? And people really do come from their corner with no desire to bridge that gap between them, right? right? And I think it is very hard to bridge a gap, and I have great admiration for your friends that moved to North Minneapolis, yeah. right? I mean, they're gonna have an appreciation and an understanding and a respect yeah. and an ability to company that nobody can who's yeah. not there. Uh, yeah. And that's really powerful. Oh, um, Dave, your mic's not turned on. I just oh. need to, oh, so. I was told to turn it on. Yeah. And I did not follow directions. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's okay. You probably, now. You're probably picked up off mine. So, yeah. uh, but uh, um, so, so, so maybe I, I, this is a little bit off track, but you, maybe just it'd be helpful just to understand the motivation of people that you know to do something like that, um, to move into a neighborhood like North Minneapolis. They, they had a deep uh, Christian faith, okay. uh, and that was a big part of it, I think. Right. And actually, they've since... Um, uh, he passed away. The young guy had uh -oh. a bike accident, passed away. But his uh -oh. wife has carried on. She formed a pizza company, and she employs kids from the north side who are almost exclusively African American. Right. And it, we, we just had them to our home for a party the other night. But I see these kids, and it goes back to what I had said about Father Greg, um, the dignity of a job and the dignity of a purpose in life, and ultimately, people want a place to go and something to do. And that's how you achieve your own dignity and sense of self-worth. And so for them, I think it was part of their spiritual faith. But you know, as I look at you in the audience, and I'm lear I've learned a lot about ILI from Tom, you know, I'm, I'm closely uh, um, approaching that stage of my career. I've been in traditional business for 42 years. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm in transition to handing off to someone eventually. But I'm, st I'm now thinking, OK, now what do I want to do? And actually, there's another really good book that I've read, which Kathleen, my wife, recommended to me, called From Strength to Strength by Arthur Brooks. And it was very helpful for me to, um, when you're in a traditional career, and, and he, the first chapter was about addiction to success. And, and whether, how do you measure success, whether it's getting a new title, more responsibility in a business career, more money, respect, recognition, but then how do you define stage two or once you, you know, break your addiction from success and how do you measure success? And I think going back to our friend the Nielsen's, for them it was a spiritual outgrowth, but I think for many it may be defining success of how can I impact the lives of others? How can I make the world a better place? And how can I create that kinship with people and share the benefit of my experience? He also talked about two themes, which was um, liquid knowledge 
and crystallized knowledge, which I thought was interesting. Liquid knowledge, he said, you know, you're at your peak performance when you're in your 20s, 30s, and say 40s, through your creativity and your risk taking and how you think about the world. But of course, when you get into your 50s and 60s, your knowledge starts to crystallize or solidify, and that crystallize was a nice word for it, um, as opposed to others. You know, it could be like um, you know, become hardened or um, fossilized. fossilized. That's the word. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, didn't yeah, choose yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but and how can you use that experience, your life experience, your work experience, your experience with people, to pass that on? And I thought it was an elegant way of thinking, essentially what you all are doing and you've had successful careers and now you're moving into how can I be an inspired leader? How can I change the world and take my crystallized knowledge and experience and share that with others? Yeah, the whole time you were talking, you're, you so much cut right to the essence of what we hope to do, right, in the context yeah. of the program. And, and kinship's part of that, right? I mean, I, what we've seen with the first three cohorts, I think that they would describe their relationship with the other members of the cohort as a kinship, as a you know, very powerful relationship that helps them. And, and you know, as uh, you know, and I know we've talked about the backgrounds and you've looked at the backgrounds of the people, and the people come from all different walks of life and a lot of different backgrounds, and I think, the idea is to maybe share some of that crystallized knowledge and unlock it. And, yeah. and there's some intentionality around you know, what we do in terms from a programmatic perspective as well right. um, to try to give people a sense that you actually can still attain new liquid knowledge yeah. even at this stage in life. I think a lot of people believe that phase is over. And um, <clears throat> I'm sure I'll get a few grins and maybe a few uh, looks when I say that's why we do a book called... Uh, uh, one of the elements of it is the great books, right? They're yeah. not, it's not easy to re-immerse into that kind of reading, but hopefully through that process, what people emerge with is a sense that, hey, I still have capacity to learn really cool, interesting new things, right. you know, even though that isn't necessarily what I've been doing because I've been drafting on the experience um, and benefit of knowledge that I had when, when I was in my 20s, 30s, and 40s. Well, it's an interesting, and I'll be interested if we have a chance afterwards to talk with, the stu with students. <laughs> um, uh, because I, it's, it's, it's an interesting, I think it's, first of all, a very important and, and inspiring um, concept because Maybe you'll agree with the statement or not. I think society is so biased. I mean, as I emerge in my 60s, I've come to a greater appreciation of the embedded ageism of society. I mean, it's, you know, all those sayings about you know, life is for the young, and just even even those that work, you know, people on the radio or TV talking about their job or going to work, and you know, I have become concerned about the words, you know, two phrases, as, as I said, I'm in the final chapters of my uh, work, traditional working career, and I've been in this current role at Cargill for uh, nine years. Retirement, I don't want to use that word yeah. because it conjures certain images, and stepping down. And, and I've said I've never stepped down from anything in my life, and it creates an image that I don't like. Right. And so I'm kind of challenging myself, okay, is this my problem? Is it something I've absorbed from society? Is it just my own sensitivity about, you know, and, and, and so Brooks in his book called it um, second curve. Right. You know, first curve is the traditional career. But there's an embedded bias that having a traditional job or being em employed um, is, you know, it, there's a value on that and being retired means you're old or you're, you know, draining resource of Social Security or Medicaid or whatever it may be. But I think one of the great things about this program from what you've told me over the years and just being here is you're looking that you can have liquefied knowledge or liquid knowledge right, right. at any age. And that's the inspiration, which is we've got 30, 40 years of life experience, of work experience. What can we do with that to inspire others and to take ourselves to the second curve or third curve or whatever it may be? Right. Well, and, and so respond to this a little bit, Dave, because yeah. I think we're on a really interesting track. Well, we, we've evolved actually in our thinking around this program from what is your next act going to be to who do you want to be? Yeah. So it's, it's more about how do you want to identify yourself in this next stage? So I think it gets a little bit to the thread you're um, tapping into with, you know, this idea of stepping down. And, and there is a bit of kind of shedding, you know, the skins that build up right um, uh, around you from a career and, you know, rethinking 
who you want to be and giving yourself license to do that. So respond to that a little bit, given your stage and uh, experience. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's an important question because, especially in traditional careers, I'll just speak for myself, and you had a tr similar career of, you know, it's, uh, what I talked about with Brooks is addiction to success or the traditional measures of success, responsibility, title, status, recognition, money, um, and that once you move beyond that, you have to find other measurements of how you define success. It's not easy to do, but that's what I liked about his phraseology of the addiction to success. That's the first thing you have to do is, is redefine what does it mean yeah. to be successful. And you know, a, a good friend of ours, one of the people we go to dinner with every yeah. December, and I told him, I don't know, six months ago, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I've named a successor. You know, sometime in the next year, I'm going to hand over the CEO title. And he said, well, then what are you going to do? <laughs> and it just kind of hit me like, I don't know. Uh, but I'd never thought that I wouldn't have something to do. But I, and I, his question wasn't meant to be, it, it just hit me the wrong way. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to have anything to do anymore. Right, right. And, and one of the things about, you know, the traditional jobs is you have that routine. I never have, a, I've never in 42 years had wondered what am I going to do tomorrow? Right. Or what am I going to be doing in four months from today? My calendar is booked out years. Right, right. And, you know, there's going to come a day where my calendar will be booked out weeks, but certainly not <laughs> right. years. Right. But I think that's part of it is breaking from the traditional. And I also, what I really like about our society and the evolution of our society in today's world, and again, curriculums like ILI, which is, you know, we, we, we can say this because whatever age we are, you know, 60s is the new 40, and right. you just make it the age you want it to, you know, 70s is <laughs> the new 30, whatever. <laughs> but you think about, tr like my dad, you know, you work till 65, and you probably work for the same company your whole life, and you probably smoked cigs and drank, drank scotch when you got home at night, yeah. and your spouse probably stayed at home, and then at 65, you retired and you had your company pension. Hey, guess what? Companies don't give pensions anymore, yeah, right. or they're frozen, or they're very different. And then you kind of play golf and go out to dinner. But now, I think society values, and we have this, you know, the, this population bubble known as baby boomers, us or Xers, right. who may be in the room. And it's, OK, we are still contributing members of society. Right. And we can do great things socially, commercially, um, spiritually, and that's I like that about the evolution of our society, despite the fact that I don't like what I believe is embedded ageism and bias against those that are not in a traditional job. Right. Well, it, it's interesting, right? I mean, what you're talking about really is kind of the animating spirit of programs like this, right? Yeah. This recognition that people who finish their <clears throat> chosen careers, you know, in their 50s or 60s, still have 20 to 30 or more potentially, right. you know, really valuable years left, and to have purpose associated with that, right. however people define it, right? And we, there's no judgment around what that is, right? But to have purpose can make a huge difference. And we talk about this concept of compressed morbidity, right? Um, uh, what, I, what my wife Sandy calls it is, what I want to be is super healthy till, um, you know, whatever it is the day I die and they get hit by a bus, right? Um, as opposed to this, state, this, this kind of continuous decline, right? Which is what you were describing, right? That right. people expected at 65 that you were just going to do this and then right. eventually someday you weren't going to wake up, right? Exactly. Um, as opposed to thinking of a way to really maintain a relevance and a purpose, however you define that. Um, is that okay. why you started this program? That is. Yeah. <laughs> I needed a relevance and a purpose. No, but I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. what inspired you? I mean, yeah. given your belief system, which I know very well, we've right. known each other for 22 years, right. and I know you're a person of faith, but what is it that inspired you to say, I want to form this program and have a curriculum and bring great people from all over the world to do this. Yeah, what it was really was I think a personal realization that being somebody who finished their traditional career at a relatively young age, um, yeah, I mean there, there's a certain pleasure to the kinds of things you described, whether it's golf or skiing for me or other yeah. things like that, right? I don't want to completely remove that from this chapter, and I want to maintain a flexibility that you can't have when your calendar's filled yeah. uh, for multiple years out. Um, but, you know, what inspired me was to say, it was, and it's, it, what I think inspired us to create the kind of program that we have here, was really the idea of can we strike this balance between creating some really powerful 
kind of core programmatic elements that help people to kind of break free from whatever constraints they put around themselves at this stage in life, but then also give them a lot of freedom by tapping into the best minds at this university so that they can tailor whatever they decide right. they want that next stage uh, to be, right? And we really do take to heart this idea of, wouldn't it have been a nicer if that person asked you, who do you want to be yeah. in your next stage instead of what yeah. do you want to do? But we're all framed yeah. around that. I don't, that's not a judgmental point, but that's really what, for me, gets me up in the morning and excited about doing this. And right. as I've told you, right, it only took me 35 years to maybe figure out what I should have been doing for 35 years because I really love the universe here. Um, it is a, you know, it is you know, hopefully getting better all the time by learning from those people that are a part of the program yeah. as, as to how to do that. It's not easy to do in, in the transition, I think. It's not easy. I haven't made the transition yet. <laughs> I just thought of another story. I had breakfast with a guy in New York about three months ago. And, and, and you know, he's roughly my age, early 60s. And uh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of transitioning. And my own belief is I've been doing this for nine years. And that you shouldn't let a CEO job or a big job become an entitlement. And that you know the power can go to your head, the the um, the addiction can go to your head to a point where you for, may forget who you are. And my right. own belief system is, I want to get out of there before that happens. Right. And I think organizations deserve change, they deserve new leadership, they deserve people with fresh eyes and and new perspectives. And and he kind of looked at me, it's like, why would you do that? You're at the peak of your powers, and I. I don't think of the job as power, but I also thought that's exactly why you do want to move on. Because if you get to this point where you think of yourself as the peak of your power, I mean, you can study political history throughout the ages, and that's when things tend to go bad. It's when you th start thinking of yourself as, as powerful or you want to accumulate more power, or that's how you ac acquire right. status is by accumulating more power. But I think the transition, that's, I think therein lies the essence of a fulfilled life, right. which is to say, I'm going to move to curve two because I am at the top of my game career-wise in the traditional business sense, but I want to find a new game or a new curve where I can be even better, albeit different. You know, it's not going to be a seven to five job, but I can have a, a greater impact on the world than maybe I did in my first curve. Right. Well, and, and, and you mentioned a number of things, which I think uh, you know kind of tap very much into the heart of what we think about here. But your comment around, I remember when you first got this role, right? Yeah. And, and I have such great respect for you because you honored, in your honoring, exactly what you said to me, I think, at the dinner. I think we got there a little bit before other people. Yeah. And I said, how long do you think you did, you'll do this? And you used the word half-life. You said, I think there's a half-life to mm. a role like this. Yeah. And I don't think I'm, you know, I, I, well, I think you actually said, I hope when the time is right, I still feel the same way that I feel today. Yeah. That, I, you know, that you just don't get so wrapped up in all of the trappings of being in a role like you have. Right. And you decide you can postpone that, you know, that moment you know, ad infinitum because of where you are. And so it's one of many reasons that uh, um, I, I, I respect you uh, because you, you've you honored that. I mean, Thank I think you. that's a really wonderful thing. Well, I mean, going back to the theme of kinship, right. um, and you and I have known each other for 22 years, and I remember when this, when I, I knew I was gonna be offered the CEO job, and I, I, did, I wasn't sure I wanted to take it. I mean, I thought I did, but I didn't grow up thinking, I wanna be a CEO someday. But I spoke to people like you, and several other friends, and obviously Kathleen, to say, you know, what does it mean? Because I think the risk is you subsume yourself. The job is so intense and so all-consuming. And I, I don't even know how tired I am. I mean, I think I'll find out one day that, um, you know, what's that old, uh, there was a, one of my favorite, um, not stories, but there was a famous author named David Foster Wallace. And he happened to go to Amherst College where I went. And he gave a graduation speech I think it was at Oberlin, but you can find it on YouTube. And the name of it is This is Water. And he starts out by talking about two, two young goldfish are swimming in the bowl, and here comes the older goldfish. And the older goldfish says, hey, boys, how's the water? And it swims away, and the, the one of the young goldfish looks at the other and says, what's water? <laughs> <laughs> Meaning you get used to your circumstances and your surroundings. And because that becomes your relevance and your context, and so I think when you, can, when you have jobs like this or jobs that I'm sure many of you have had, you get caught up in it and you forget about, you, you run the risk of losing who you are, of subsuming yourself to the job, right. 
uh, subordinating your, subverting yourself, that's the word I'm trying to come up with, subverting yourself to the job, and what did you miss in terms of what could you have done? That's, I think, why you're here, is discovering what can you do next, or uh, incrementally from here, from your, your successful career, and so that you don't just forget, that you don't say, what is water? I, I, I want to find water and air and <laughs> you know, land and sea and, and make people, myself, and the world better. So it, uh, you, you, you tapped a little bit into the kinship element. So talk, yeah. talk a little bit about maybe relationships and you know, kind of encounters that you've had with people that you'd consider kin that have had an influence yeah. on you and caused you to think uh, and believe the way you do. Well, I mean, you're one of them, and so we met in 2020 when I, uh, sorry, 2000, uh, uh, when I went to work at Piper. And there's five of us that were on the management team there that became very, very good friends. And at least once a year, sometimes twice, we get together to reconnect and to talk about each other's lives. And one of our friends is always, you know, tell me about your kids and tell me about your, your marriage and tell me about your life. But, I mean, nobody got anywhere without someone else's help. I mean, to right. think that I, um, I knew a person in business who I said to them, um, you know, is there something I can do to help you or support you? Actually, I can think of two people. And they said, you know, I really keep my own counsel. And I was kind of a, not offended by it, but I was shocked. Right. How could you keep your own counsel? <laughs> How could you think that you're so smart and so wise and so informed that you don't need somebody else's advice? or that you don't rely on somebody else's advice. And before I said yes, so the person, my predecessor said, I'm gonna to go to the board and recommend you to be the CEO. Just wanna make sure you're gonna take it if we <laughs> offer it to you. And I said, I'd like to think about it. And I spoke to you and, and another friend of ours um, and a couple of other people, I was in my 50s at the time, people that were in their 60s and 70s, and ask for their advice. I mean, what would you know? Would you take the job, or what do you, I think? I, what should I be watching out for? But I think what kinship and relationship, and I'm, I consider myself very relational. My right. friendships are very important to me because I get joy from them, but I also get advice and I get perspectives. And you don't always agree with your close friends or your your kin, um, but you 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 think I wouldn't do it that way, or I don't agree with that, or I do and I would. But that's how you accumulate your crystallized knowledge to right. reset yourself for liquid, li liquid knowledge. Right. But I, I, I just enjoy studying people and human nature, but I think that's what kinship's all about. Yes, yeah, so there's this concept, I mean, you know, I think as um, we, you know, when we were on the business side of life, or when I was on the business side of life, I would have called it kind of personal board of directors. Yeah. Parker Palmer has this idea of clearness committee, right? Yeah. It's those people that are those people that you trust that are gonna not necessarily always give you the right answers, but uh, as I've learned in work I've done with somebody's in the audience here, uh, Professor Reifenberg, uh, ask the right questions, right? right? And hopefully that's what that's what I've certainly found when I've been exactly the situation with you, right? Where when I was thinking about do I move on or do I finish up, right? And right. I reached out to you just as you had done to me. And the beauty of you is you just asked me a bunch of questions about, well, you know, why are you thinking about this? What do you want? And, and allowed me to get to my own conclusion, right? right? And that's what I think can do, right? To yeah. use that word. Um, uh, and and uh, that's, I think, the power of having those kind of relationships. And, and the beauty of it is, I think, for a lot of people when they finish their traditional career, the, the, they find that some people they th thought were kin aren't actually kin. Yeah. They just happen to be people who were highly responsive because of your role. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I'm imagining you're kind of thinking a little bit about, you know, is there going to be that divide in your life? I, I, I'm very much thinking about yeah. it um, because of the stage of my career. Yeah. And, um, you know, Kathleen and I have joked a lot about it that, you know, the day I got the title, all of a sudden your jokes are a little funnier. <laughs> uh, people are writing down stuff you say yeah. uh, in the company. Um, you got friends coming out of the woodwork. It's going to be interesting when the time comes when I, you know, pass the CEO role to my successor who uh, kind of um, falls away. Right. And, you know, my jokes won't be quite as funny as they once were. Right. And, and then, you know, just like who really were my friends? Right. And right. especially inside the company, were they my friends because of the title that I had or the potential decisions I could make that would, right. you know, favor them? Or was it that we truly had a friendship? I've got some theories already. Right. Right. But um, that'll be part, I mean, it'll, I think it'll be painful 
because it's a reality of, okay, were the friendships based on your title or on who you were? But again, I think that's part of the transition, right. and it's part of the going to curve too, yep. and, it's, and it's part of you know um, shedding the shackles or the addictions to success right. or to your traditional right. career. Right. Yeah, and, and you know maybe we'll close with this in terms of our uh, dialogue and open it up. But Great. you know, what I, one of the things, another thing that I've always greatly appreciated for you for is your just your authenticity and your Thank directness. You. And and uh, um, so talk a little bit about that, just in the context of relationships and how do you think that and leadership, right? I mean, how how do you maintain an authenticity yeah. in a world that oftentimes seems to honor the unauthentic? I think in <laughs> leader, yeah, it you know it it does, and you could. I mean, you could, I, I won't start going down the path of, you know, what category of people in the public view are most inauthentic, um, but Tuesday was a special day in that, yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I think doing what, doing what you say you're going to do, but I think today's world, and I, I don't know, was it like this when, I, when you and I first went into business? Probably there was this hierarchy of, well, there's the CEO or there's the CFO, and you know, you didn't interact with them, and you know the corner office, and their own private dining rooms, and all those th traditional aspects of business in the '60s, '70s, even '80s, maybe '90s. Yeah. Whereas today, I think our society values that authenticity, right. and those that you lead, they want to know who you are. You know, what do you stand for? What are your values? Um, how did you get to where you are? I mean, I, I as I said, I love studying leadership and think I want to be like her or I don't want to be like him. And, but I think the common denominator is that their, their real selves are authentic. They let you in, they let you know who you are. Um, I, you know, I go down to the cafeteria to eat lunch. I pause and try and get to know somebody's name and try and remember them the next time that, that I see them. But I think there's little aspects of who you are that the other thing is we're just passing through. Life or the title, I mean, it, Cargill's 157 years old. Right. I'm the ninth CEO in history. Right. And there'll be a 10th and there'll be a tw 11th and 12th. Right. I just got lucky enough to have the job. And right. the honor's on me, but the obligation's on me is to share that honor and to lead people and to let them know I'm just a regular person. I've got my fears and my doubts and my anxieties, just like you do. Right. It's just a different job and a different role. You've been close to leadership. Right. You've been close to you know in people that have big responsibility. Right. The best ones are the ones that show you who they are. Right. I mean, right. you and I have had conversations. That group of guys where people have broken down, they've cried, they've right. talked about things that are upsetting them about right. their kids. Right. That's what authenticity right. ultimately. That's what right. kinship is. Right. I think that's exactly right, Dave. And I think you know when when I think about what is the beauty of a forum like this and what the objective of a forum like this, and I think it's a good, great segue to some questions, is it, it's been my hope that we'd have exactly the opportunity to do this, to show the authentic human side of people that I think oftentimes are looked at in a very kind of narrowly defined box, right, of this individual or people that are in these kind of roles are this way. And I've been very blessed, and a lot of these people are people we know in common, to know yeah. people that I know are amazingly great human beings, you know, with great values, um, and all of those kinds of things, and people don't get a chance to see that, right? Yeah. And, and that's, I think, the power of it, and uh, you've been wonderful today in sharing well, just you. that, I think, uh, with our audience. And I think that, as much as anything, is what we want to do. And I think, you know, my hope is that it's also inspirational not only to people that are here, but to those people that are listening to us and are hoping that they have, you know, potentially an opportunity to tap into this kind of uh, thing as well. So with that, um, uh, Joe and Ashley have microphones, because for those of you that are here, because we do have an audience that we want to be able to uh, hear us. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Otherwise, if there are questions that have come in, um, Emily will bring those up to me as well. So, any questions from the audience here? Yeah, Julia. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. No, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. And it, the conversation was fascinating. So this isn't necessarily a question so much as a comment listening to you. Yeah. We all have been paired with MBA students. And I met with mine yesterday, a young lady, 26 years old. She wanted, to, she wanted to know how, as a female, I survived mm. a whole long career as a female executive. Mm. I thought that was really telling where her mindset yeah. is. And my last pr 
professional position was an, I had a private practice as an executive coach. So in some respects, I coached her yesterday. She was taking copious notes mm -hmm. of things. She said, I've never heard that before. Nobody's ever said that to me before. And I realized she's lived in a silo. Yeah. What, did you, what was your advice to her? Oh, I, I told her some things about listening with your eyes. Yeah. That, and she said, I've never heard that. And I said, do you understand what that means? And she said, no. And I said, well, if you listen with your eyes, that means you're totally present. You're totally who you are. You're totally authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, so here's a gender biased comment. Have you ever watched two women have a conversation? They turn to each other and they face and look at each other right in the eye. If you look at two men, yeah. they're side to side. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Or they're only looking around and doing other things, but I think that's a great piece of advice is the personal connection to say, I'm in the moment, I am listening to what you say, and that you matter to me at the moment. But it's, it's inter I mean, even with a new generation of diversity and inclusion, it is still, for women in business, it is still a challenge. It is, we are not there yeah. as a society. Hi, I'm hi, Timmy Griffin. Thank Tammy, you. Tammy, hi. So um, you, you mentioned what I wanted to ask a question about. I've worked in organizations, large and small, and over my career, DNI has come up, and yeah. the organization has put strategies together yeah. and training. And so I'm very curious, from a kinship perspective within Cargill, what does it look like for you know someone, a diverse employee, in terms of being part of the culture, of yeah. being part of a kinship group within your organization? You know, we've uh, we've come a long way, and when I took this job in 2013. Um, I set that as one of my primary goals for culture change at Cargill, was we are going to be more diverse. When I first joined the leadership team in 2008, uh, there were eight Caucasian men, of which four were named Dave, if you can believe that. <laughs> I was one of those four. Yeah. Today we have 13 members, six are women, um, two are of color, and oh, in the, when I first joined the team, I was the only one that had worked at another company. They, they had all worked from day one out of college at Cargill. So for me, I thought the only way we're going to be better as a company and that, we're, that we will have success is if we change our culture to be more inclusive, to be more diverse, diverse meaning ethnicity, gender, life experience, work experience. And the transformation, and you know, I guess ultimately the story will be written after I'm gone, but I think the transformation in the culture has been profound because our, our general counsel, for example, is African American. And she, uh, one of the corporate secretary at the time was African American. And this kind of, it, 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 when she first said this to me, when our general counsel started, our corporate secretary said, this is the first black manager I've ever had. And she never, never had, had you've never had one. Never. And it broke my heart. And I thought, first of all, that's something that I never, I mean, I should have thought about that, but this is water, right? Because my water was, the, was white America. But here, for her to have a black supervisor really made a difference. And the other thing is we have grown the ranks of our African-American attorneys because they see, okay, if I could be general counsel at that company, based basis on where I'm coming from and being African American, and I don't think people would have thought that before in a past world. So I think it's transformational when you have that as part of your culture strategy, is people you lead want to look up at the top and see, that looks like me. I recognize that person or I recognize aspects of that person. But if it's eight white guys, four of which are named Dave, <laughs> How in the world are we going to attract diverse, diversity to the company? And that has um, been one of my prouder legacies at the company. Thanks for the question. Tammy. Yes, sir, uh, Tim Weber here. Thanks for being here. Is it Tim? Sorry. Tim, yes. Yeah, hi, Tim. Yeah. Um, just so you know, when you, when you do walk away, it's going to be OK. I did it in May. Um, yeah. My jokes were not as funny. <laughs> in fact, people walk by me. Uh, <laughs> but it's going to be OK. Thanks um, for saying that. The, the, um, 
So a little kind of, I'm, I'm curious what you've learned over your last nine years of CEO on Kinship. And I, yeah, I got it, um, and really from a corporate perspective, you yeah. know, how have you gone about delivering your message through a very large corporation, yeah. right? Global corporation, to make sure that your message is being heard. Yeah. I mean, it's easy, it's easy in the C-suite, it's easy, happened in your headquarters because you can go have lunch with someone. Right. But how did you do that corporately and what did you learn worked versus what didn't work? Yeah. I started out thinking, okay, I am going to um, get to know everybody in this company. I mean, say that facetiously. We have 160,000 employees. So that wasn't going to happen. Um, but I think, one, it was travel. And one of the things, we have 1,200 facilities around the world that make food in some form. And so I worked very hard to travel, to be on the, on the floor of the factories, to talk to the people, uh, to, sh to, you know, you vote with your feet, or where you are shows what you care about. So for me, it was a, like, we, have a, we are in the salt business, and we have a salt mine in um, 1,500 feet below the surface of Lake Erie in Cleveland, which is pretty amazing. You drop down in a, in a mine shaft, and then you drive out an ATV, seven miles where they're mining salt and you look up and you think Lake Erie's up there. Very weird moment. <laughs> um, and you're thinking, I hope it doesn't, there isn't a leak. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we had lunch with the employees there and just, I, I went, we have a chicken facility in Costa Rica and same thing, we went to the employee lunchroom and somebody said, I used to work at another company, whatever it was, and the CEO would come and they'd have handlers and we'd see them walking on the campus or the facility with their briefcase. They never came and talked to us. And I think, I think the, the impact of having those moments and interacting with people uh, can be exponential. That word will spread. Here's, I had lunch with the CEO. I'd never met the CEO of my company in prior years. Kathleen and I used to be pre-COVID, once a quarter, but obviously it's always gonna be headquarters employees, we would have 10 people to our house for dinner, and it was always either diverse people, people that were new to the company, or persons of color, or young women, and just to get to know them. And we try, you know, we try and mix up conversation and topics, kind of a salon environment. Let's talk, it doesn't have to, let's not talk about work. But I, I think to have that, not to become isolated, and it would have been really easy. I, I got this nice office, you know, with my own bathroom, <laughs> and nice windows to sit up there and become isolated. But I think you've got to get out. The second so is person-to-person is -person contact as much as you can with a company this big. Secondly is using, using video technology. So during COVID, and you all know what it was like, um, I, in, starting in April, I went down to the studio in the basement and filmed a video every single week. Uh, to say, here's what's going on, here's what we're doing, but it was always about, we're focusing, number one, on your health and safety. And in the seventh week, I said to our head of communications, I said, I, I, I am so tired of doing this, I can't hear myself talk anymore. <laughs> and she said, it's not about you. You're talking to your company. And the emails that I got, and the emails I still, still get to say, thank you for doing that. And, you know, I talked about, I'm scared too, I don't know what's going on. Uh, we're trying to figure this out and to show hopefully some authenticity. So I think the form of communication video and what's that um, saying about how you communicate seven times seven in seven different forms of medium. But I think communication, to let people know who you are. You know, I get on Teams, I got an IM from somebody down in South America yesterday saying, hey, I'm leaving Friday, but I just wanted to say thanks. I wrote him back, I IM'd him back. But being accessible to the extent that you can and not isolated, I think that's how you form kinship, but that's how you um, let people know what you stand for. And, and just to be a human being and not some fancy person with a fancy title in an office. Thanks, Tim. My name's Dave. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Were you in that leadership team in 2008 that I was on? So I, I appreciate your comment about um, 
kinship and seeking advice. Yeah. Uh, one of the challenges of somebody seeking advice is what happens to the relationship when you don't follow the advice that you've yeah. been given. Does that, I mean, that's how some, you say, what should I do? Somebody tells you, I think you should do this. And yeah. when you don't do this, how does that affect the, uh, your group or your relationship with that person? I mean. It's a great question. And I think it's particularly meaningful and relevant in managing your board of directors. Because, you know, we have six former CEOs on our board of directors, the former <laughs> CEO of IBM, just joined our, our direct, uh, board. They're really smart, accomplished people. They want to come in and tell you what to do. And that's not the role of a director. They're, you're, the role of a director is to be to give advice and to give wisdom and to be have oversight and governance, but not to be operating. And some of those directors, they start going into operate like you should do this, I would do that. That's not, and I'm on two boards. I try never to use the word should, would, I would do this, but more more so the Socratic method. And you alluded to it, Tom, right. when you and I have spoken. I got an opinion, right. but you're not asking me for my opinion. Right. I think you're asking me for, help me think this through. Right. And so I will ask you questions. Have you thought about this? Or why do you want to do that? Right. Open-ended questions that aren't yes or no. Right. And so I think you're right, Dave. I think particularly with your board, if you ask them, you know, what would you do here? And you think, eh, I don't think that's what I'm going to do. And then they're, they're going to be offended that you didn't take their advice. And I think also part of being, you know, having kinship is, here's what I would do. Hey, did you do that, Tom? No. You know, not being offended by it. <laughs> and that, hey, we've got a friendship. We've known each other for 22 years. He didn't take my advice. But it can, especially, I think, in a board relationship, it can create awkwardness if, you know, you go specifically. So you've, I think as a CEO, when you're managing your board, you've got to go in more seeking broad input as opposed to asking a binary question. And so a part of it is a tactic in how you manage your board. But it's a, it's a relevant question that can lead to, well, I guess he didn't like that advice. You know, it's, <laughs> it, it, can be very, it can be very touchy. Right. Right. Did you have a question? All right. Thank you. I want to really Tell me your name. Amos Fon from Amos. Cameroon. I see me from, from Yaoundé. Yeah. <laughs> you know Yaoundé? I have not been there, but I know it's the capital of Cameroon. Sure. <laughs> I've been to Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Great. Your neighbors. Yeah. Yes, they are. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your talking and sharing with us today. I think the magic, because you talked about success addiction. Yeah. And, and that's a challenge. When, when somebody starts making it, he just keeps yeah. Making it. The magic of a program like this one is to be able to detach yourself and spend a year here, yeah. whether it's 10 months. That's the magic of the program because I you know. Now, the question I have is is it easy for those detachments, having reached that level and so many things to do? How is it easy? Now, let me not call it step down as you were talking, step forward. Yeah. Because to me, you are stepping forward to become a greater force. Yeah. For good. Why am I saying this? When we work, we work on careers. But when you step down, you start thinking about legacy. Right. I'm not saying that in a career there's no legacy. Right. But this one is different. It's more now about what am I really leaving behind out of the career? Right. How is it easy to detach yourself? Yeah. Because when like I said, the magic is sitting here and doing everything here without those right. other things out there. Right. It is. right. Which is why you're in this class. Now, so Tim told me it's going to be OK. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's helpful. So I've gotten the benefit of, the, of, of you. But I would, I'm guessing that, and Tom has told me, one of the great things about this cohort is the ability to connect with others and create new relationships, create kinship with people that are coming from different walks of life but similar walks of life in that you all are now into curve two and realize, you know what? It's okay. There's an, I got out of the water. Now I know what's outside the water. I'm not the goldfish anymore. Right. And um, I gotta think it's gotta be, I mean, 
I want to do this. I don't know if I'll do it here at Notre Dame or somewhere else, yeah. but it, it's, it's, I think it's a wonderful program that you've created Thanks. Thanks. Uh, with great people. Yeah. Well, it, it is, uh, uh, like I said, and you've heard me say this, right, it's been one of the great blessings of my life to be able to be engaged in something like this, right, and hopefully to, you know, um, <clears throat> one of the people who you'll meet later today said, our objective is to create a space for this. That's all yeah. we can really do, right? right, is to create a space for this and hopefully, you know, uh, make that space be as rich and valuable as possible. But ultimately, that space is shaped, and we, uh, the leadership team for the ILA was talking about this yesterday. Every cohort, we have the same uh, admission criteria, and we reach out to the same groups. I think is so dramatically different. So you all shape that yeah. space so powerfully different based on who all of you are that it gets, it's a testament to the fact that this program is really about the individuals that are part of it, that become hopefully well, exactly. kin and go forward. And I had mentioned to you, that's been one of the wonderful things too, is just seeing how that kinship forms and those relationships solidify. But isn't that, as I think that's the essence of leadership too. And yeah. somebody said to me once, people aren't gonna remember what you did. They're gonna remember how you made them feel. Right. right. That's and that's right. the impact of leadership. Like, hey, you know, look at the P&L or look at the, uh, the, the acquisition we did. It's, right. Right. And that's where I think, especially in, in my, you know, closing chapters, how can I give people confidence? How can I make them feel good about themselves and that they can be successful? And I think ultimately that's what leadership, I think that's what it, it's at the core of effective leadership. Right. Well, and the, the other thing which I think you alluded to is I think good leaders are learning. It's certainly been my um, experience here every day, right? I mean, just your experience um, that you related around the general right. counsel, right? That, you know, you just don't think about the fact that unless if somebody that you can really relate to in a meaningful way is in a role that you can aspire to, you right. may not. Uh, you, you don't, you know, you're, you don't understand the water unless you've kind of exactly. seen that, right? And so <clears throat> those kinds of things and being willing and open to learn, and that's another thing that we hope to inspire in people that are part of this and also the people we reach through this is the willingness to continuously be open to learning and not just saying, right. I know what I know and I'm going to be stuck. Wouldn't that, that be sad though? Like yeah. I have yeah, got all the knowledge I'm going to have, but yeah. to always be thinking, how can I be better or to learn more right. to come back to you know, University of Notre Dame right. at this stage of life? I mean, what a wonderful opportunity but also what a wonderful wonderful philosophy of, hey, I've learned all I'm going to learn. I'm just going to go play golf or <laughs> swim or walk right. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and I'll surround myself with a bunch of people that think exactly Precisely. like I do, right? Yeah. And that, you know, to, your, to the authenticity, I think we're to the point of needing to wrap up, actually. Sadly, it vaporized very quickly, as, uh, <laughs> as I expected it might Time do. has a way of doing and, that, and Time it? does yeah. have a way of doing that, even more so, I think, as uh, we get older. But uh, um, to the point of authenticity, I think... That's been, always been one of the beauties, I think, of you and the kind of relationship, right, to the point of advice. I mean, we've both given each other or asked questions which probably got toward, you know, people understood what the intent was. And, if, uh, and, and we probably each looked at each other and said, okay, <laughs> sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you do that? Yeah, um, right. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, and, 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 and that's also, I think, a little bit of why a program like this ends up shaping itself because, you know, in the context of what we do, not everything works, right? And right. we even talk about that in the context of the classes. We'll put a whole lot of different concepts in front of people. If a subset of those resonate and help people to be better guided going forward, we're yeah. thrilled. If, if the expectation, like it is when you're an undergrad, that you gotta know all of this and somehow or another embrace all of that is gonna be on, because it's gonna be on a test, it's a very different environment, right? right. You can be much more discerning about where that goes. Exactly. So, well, I'm gonna wrap up with okay. gratitude. Uh, first my, of all, thank honor. you thank very, you. very much for being here. This is precisely how I hoped and knew, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, uh, given our relationship, this would go. Um, you know, what I will say to the spirit of learning, um, that's the beauty of things like this, right? Even though we've known each other for 22 years, um, I learned even more wonderful things about you and how you, you think about things. And I think those things will be really valuable, not only to the people that are here, but to our broader audience. So I just want to say thanks to you. Thanks to you, Kathleen, for uh, joining us here. Uh, and uh, truly appreciate it. I have felt so, this feel the same way. So okay. thank you for having thank me. You. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.